And I'd like to invite on to the stage our first speaker, um, Ian Angel, Emeritus Professor of Information Systems at the London School of Economics, author of The New Barbarian Manifesto, How to Survive the Information Age. Um, he's dubbed the Angel of Doom. So I'm changing the mood now. Okay. Um, that was by the Times newspaper. Um, Ian knows Krakow well. He was at our conference last year. Um, he shook us up a bit, so we thought we'd get him back specifically to talk about our future here in, in Krakow. Ian. Thank you, Andrew. Well, Andrew asked me to put on my futurologist hat and to give my vision of the future. And so the subtitle of the talk is, I have seen the future and it works. Now, this is a quote made by Lincoln Steffens, an American journalist, in 1919 at the start of the Soviet Union. So I don't want you to forget the irony as the talk progresses. And talking of the Soviet Union, Trotsky said, history is the natural selection of accidents. And our world today is full of accidents just waiting to happen. They will either catapult us into uh, new prosperity or relegate us to poverty, obscurity, and extinction. Information and communication technologies are taking us out of the machine age the industrial age into who knows what. So where does Krakow fit in this new world economic order? This is not a world for the timid. Remember President Pompidou's warning. There are three roads to ruin. Gambling, <laughs> women, and technology. Gambling is the quickest. Women the most pleasurable, but technology the most certain. So will technology lead to ruin? Well, we may be damned if we do, but we're doubly damned if we don't. We don't have a choice. Remember Machiavelli's famous last words. On his deathbed, the priest was delivering the last rites. Do you renounce the devil and all his works? to which Machiavelli replied, this is no time to be making enemies. <laughs> no individual, no firm, no region, no country can just renounce the works of this devil's technology. The very fact that computer technology is so diabolical means that this is a time of great opportunity, but also it is one of great danger. Telecoms networks covering the globe with cable and satellite enable everyone in the world, well, those who can afford it, to talk to everyone else. And anyone bypassed faces ruin. Success will be determined by unique social, political, organizational, and particular personal factors, not just the functional. This is not a nice, neat, tidy transition. It is a severe and a total dislocation with the past. We are at a crossroads. The old ways lead nowhere. Societies are stratifying. New elites are appearing. At the 2014 World Economic Forum in Davos, Oxfam claimed that the world's 85 richest people were as wealthy as the poorest half of the world. Wow, each shares $1.5 trillion. The wealth of the, the world's 1% richest people, which amounts to $110 trillion, is 65 times as much as what the poorest half owns. Now, we're not here to discuss the rights and wrongs of this, but to accept the political reality. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And in the words of a great American philosopher, I've been rich and I've been poor. Believe me, honey, rich is better. <laughs> Inexorably, in this slow redistribution of wealth that has occurred over the last centuries, we're finding it's reversing and rapidly 
Karl Marx said that every technology leads to alienation, which eventually leads to a polarization in wealth. Of course, it will all even out in the long run. Eventually, we all get the same amount of ice, except the rich get it in the summer and the poor get it in the winter. <laughs> it's time to rid ourselves of that backward-looking idea that work involves physical effort. Of course, labor is needed, but there's a world full of laborers out there. The International Labour Organization calculated that in 2013, 800 million workers were living on less than $2 a day. That means semi-skilled and unskilled labour have become a commodity and must compete on price. Why should the world's underemployed all live in developing countries? The automation and exportation of jobs is sending shockwaves through Western workforces previously protected by national interests, but which are now incapable of fending off foreign incursions. And as for the factories and the headquarters, the teleworkers, they can be recited, moving from high-cost areas to low-cost. And there are a host of countries out there making international businessmen and women an offer they can't refuse. The motto for everyone is add value or perish. It's a tough world out there and there's no room for sentimentality in a world where quality is far more important than quantity. Individuals, companies, countries have no choice. They must ask and answer some very brutal questions concerning which workers are resources and which are liabilities. This is not being callous, unscrupulous, unprincipled, or immoral. It is natural. Nature is not immoral when it has no pity for the degenerate. Uh, and as with a factory, a typical factory employs one man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog, and the dog makes sure the man doesn't touch anything. In the UK, there are more people working in Indian restaurants than in iron and steel, shipbuilding, coal industries combined. This is amazing. The bureaucratic structures of enterprise can no longer uh, they can be spontaneously created in software and supported by outsourcing anywhere in the cloud. According to Peter Drucker, humanity is polarizing into two employment categories, the intellectual, cultural, and business elite, the mobile and independent knowledge workers, you, the alphas, and the rest, the immobile and dependent service workers. Now, let me expand on what Drucker means by this term. You are not service workers. You are what Robert Reich calls symbolic analytic knowledge workers. Problem identifiers, solvers, brokers with unique or at least very rare skills that are sold across the globe uh, uh, with telecommunications media. Reich splits Drucker's service workers into two groups. In-person services, such as hairdressers, school teachers, universities professors, shop assistants, deliverers of a particular service on an individual basis, but who have to differentiate themselves on price as well as quality. And at the bottom of the rung, there's the, there's the routine production services, laborers, factory workers, truck drivers, who, who deliver their products anonymously. Drucker himself dislikes the term knowledge worker because he is clear that the real issue is not knowledge, but talent because knowledge in, by, and for itself achieves absolutely nothing. It is that very rare commodity, human talent, which is the stuff of work in tomorrow's world. Paradoxically, only human talent can leverage the added value from technology. One thing never changes, the need for innovation. However, innovation does not happen just because of capital investment in scientific and technological research. These deliver mere possibilities. Continuous innovation by the talent worker is the key to success. But there are clever people everywhere. So why is prosperity so unevenly distributed? 
Performance depends on this balance between social capital and an investment in both physical infrastructure and individual intellectual capital. It's how a group sets about ruling itself, the type of rules it makes, the way it treats the creators of wealth that separates success from failure. Spectacular growth comes from firms that thrive on their own energy and that of their surroundings. Now, one company that has grasped this new reality is Boeing. According to a spokesman, Boeing's core business is not making airplanes, it is knowing how to make airplanes. As long as Boeing contains the intellectual property rights, they can profit by building their planes anywhere they can find a talented workforce. Hence, they're looking at Taiwan. The individual innovator ultimately generates wealth. Hence, labor and talent must no longer be treated under one single heading. Individuals are not standardized units. Talent, the great divider of humanity, must be seen as the diviner of economic success. It's in short supply, and so it's in great demand. No company, no country, no region can succeed without a talented workforce. Because talent work must either go to where the talent workers are, or these alphas must be seduced away. There are enormous opportunities for those alphas who have the vigor and the vitality, the nerve to break free of the limitations drawn in the past and who have the vision to redraw their own future. Alphas are selling their skills in the global marketplace. Remember Thomas Jefferson's words, merchants have no country. The mere spot where they stand on does not constitute so strong an attachment as that from which they draw their gain. Alphas can leave a country just as easily as they enter it, looking to arbitrage their skills. The umbilical cords have been cut. The globalized individual, the globalized innovative company, no longer feels the need to support the national aspirations of the country of its birth. We are witnessing a merging of intellectual capital and financial capital that will fundamentally change capitalism. Not like that French idiot Piketty talks about. This is not about poor and inequality. This is about alphas. The only stable environment, relationship between capital and talent, the only viable model for employment will be the star system. Typical of the sport, entertainment, and financial sectors, which are prototypical information industries. A few stars uh, earn huge sums of money, the middle is relatively well off, and a large rump of wannabes work part-time on a casual basis, hoping to make it to the big time. In a rapidly integrating world economy, talent workers can flee a country, and so these elite generators must be bribed to stay. But alphas are not just looking for money, rather a pleasant environment in which they can meet other alphas and expand on their expertise. They're looking for hotspots, so they want to be where the action is. They know that without renewal of their skills, they will quickly lose their alpha status. 60 years ago, Joseph Schumpeter explained growth in terms of a rush of technological innovation, a competition between firms, creating an upsurge in investment and new industries in these economic hotspots. But both talent workers and innovative firms cluster in hotspots. The very concentration acting as a magnet for established innovators and a spur to new enterprise. Witness the developments in Silicon Valley, witness Krakow and what's happened here, the miracle over the last 10 years. Just look at the wide range of nationalities now that are working with Aspire. As for companies, they think globally, because they can communicate globally, and because the shareholders, the executive, and the employees are spread out across the globe. Successful enterprises are indifferent to, they are unhindered by national boundaries and barriers. 
The now transnational company will relocate physically, fiscally, and electronically to where the profit is greatest and the regulation is least. Global enterprises do not identify with a particular country and they walk away just as easily as they enter it. They assemble the, their assets in hotspots to take advantage of any temporary business opportunity and then they separate, each company moving on to its next major deal. The apparent size of the firm can be amplified far beyond the physical reality. A company's national footprint needs to be more, no more than a warehouse and an outsourced sales force supported by a contact center. But it must be underpinned by a global network of alphas. You are what you claim to be. You are what you can deliver via a telecoms network. That well-known cartoon of two dogs sitting on front of a PC says it all. On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Nobody knows and nobody cares as long as you can deliver the goods. And so individuals can come from nowhere to be a major force in a relatively short time. The successful hotspot will engender an institutional environment that mobilizes intellectual talent and promotes and finances entrepreneurial activity by delivering the right incentives. If the elite of migrating global players can be convinced to stay, then a virtuous circle of success is ensured as their wealth is invested locally. Governments have no choice other than to acquiesce to the will of global enterprises. An employed citizen is a tax-paying citizen. States will embark on regulatory arbitrage to tempt financial sector and high-tech companies. Not only will state be pitted against state, but area against area, town against town, even suburb against suburb. As Daniel Bell so eloquently put it 50 years ago, the nation state is too small for the big things and too big for the small things. Some futurologists expect that in the not too distant future, the number of states in the UN will increase from its present number of 193 to over 1,000. And what is going to replace the nation state? Smart regions, hotspots prospering in a climate of individualism, an intellectual and financial freedom. The medieval city-state is being reinvented as a smart city, an evil at the hub of global electronic and transport networks, but within electronic, not stone walls. The Hanseatic League is being reborn. Territory in itself is a liability. Smart regions do not subsidize large tracts filled with rusting industry and populated by the unemployed. To protect their wealth, rich areas will right-size, ensuring a high proportion of wealth-creating knowledge workers to wealth-depleting service workers. They reject the liberal attitudes of the 20th century. The expanding underclass that they spawned and the untrained migrants that they were previously welcomed are now seen as liabilities. Many too many are born. The state was devised for the superfluous ones. Mass production methods needed an oversupply of humanity. The machine age spawned the nation state, but with its demise, what is to be done with the glut of people as we enter the information age? Growth is created from the talent of knowledge workers, not from the labor of low-grade service and production workers. National economies can no longer grow themselves out of unemployment. Growth has been decoupled from employment. Out-of-touch politicians make the direct comparison between the information revolution and the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution took well over 50 years to sort itself out and even then, the social conditions of the workers were far from ideal. But that revolution merely changed one type of physical worker, the agricultural, to another, the industrial. The information revolution is going to need intellectual muscle. Do the people who held 
factory or low-grade office and retail jobs have what it takes in the information age. The jury is out, but the very best I expect is a couple of lost generations. The big question that every country has to answer is why do some areas become successful hotspots and with others are doomed to failure? Which areas are going to win? Will Krakow win? The answer is amazingly simple. When an area is attractive to both capital and knowledge workers, it can win. Otherwise, it fails. But capital by itself does not create wealth. Without the commitment of elite knowledge workers, areas will fall into a vicious circle of decline. Owners of intellectual and financial wealth must be made welcome. Both companies and countries must pay a premium to attract knowledge workers and to keep them. Foreign entrepreneurial investors with one million pounds at their disposal can bypass the usual entry rules into Britain. 104 billionaires with a combined wealth of 301 billion now live in Britain. Uh, um, London is, has now 72 billionaires. It's the more billionaires than any other town in the world. 39 of them were not born in the UK. Moscow has 48 and New York has 43. So there are more, million, there are more billionaires in Moscow than there are in New York. In the US, there's a fast-track immigration policy for businessmen and women who can offer $1 million and guarantee to employ 10 people. Thousands of millionaires emigrated to the USA. Then there's the H-1B program, hands out six-year visas to uh, hundreds of thousands of skilled high-tech workers every year. It's not really surprising. There's a shortfall of nearly a million high-tech workers in the US. The US is even looking for over a million nurses in the next decade. And they're going to steal them for whatever they can. States are now learning that they are now just another form of commercial enterprise, frantically trying to find employment for their masses. And they will have to be run like corporations to survive economically on the efforts of an elite few. No nation state has an automatic right to exist. The role of the corporation state in this new order is, as I put here, to produce the right people with the right knowledge and expertise as raw materials for global companies that can profit from the information age, to service these companies and to provide them with an efficient infrastructure, a minimally regulated market, and a secure and stable and comfortable and entertaining environment. If a state cannot produce sufficient quality people product, it has to buy them from abroad, drag them off the planes if necessary. States will be scouring the globe for elite knowledge workers, no matter what their age, their sex, their race, their religion. But nobody wants more service workers who are increasingly seen as liabilities. State barriers will be thrown up everywhere to keep out alien service workers each state has a surplus of its own to support. The alphas themselves now know that their futures lie in hotspots. You know your futures lie in hotspots. Is Krakow a hotspot? We're at the flux point. We can move one way or the other. I have seen the future, and it is not a time for despair. Quite the opposite. It is a time of great opportunity an opportunity for the few, a great opportunity for you. It is in such times that new empires are made, and today that means global business empires. For a few companies, for a few individuals, for a few smart regions, the future looks very bright. I have seen the future, and it works. It works for the elite cosmopolitan knowledge worker. It works for hotspots. I have seen the future, and it works. Will it work for Krakow? Krakow has got everything going for it, so don't blow it. Thank you very much. <laughs>